Davos Pavilion, the Ice House, built by these two fine fellows, amongst many others, Stan Stalnaker, Bill McDonough. But I want to focus not on the present, but I want to look at the future. So where, what does this building, for example, look like in 50 years? Well, the fact that you can even ask that question is the answer to that question. Because it, we call it Wonder Frame because we wonder what it will be, what it is. And the idea of this building is that the materials and the things about it are endlessly reusable, either in their current form or in new forms. So it will take new forms in 2050. But these molecules can still be providing human services without becoming CO2 emissions or becoming some toxic dross. So the answer to your question is yes. This building will be here in mm -hmm. 2050. But just like Rome wasn't built in a day, some of those buildings have lasted for 2,000 years because of the utility mm -hmm. that they offer. They're designed with beautiful proportions. They can be used for almost any human purpose. Mm -hmm. Think of loft buildings in cities that become apartments and offices. This can become anything, and that's its power. Stan, what do you think about what hub culture is going to look like by 2050? What are you building? Well, we've been working with Bill on this building, but in a very different way. Um, I often talk about this idea that hub culture and the people who operate hub culture are soup makers. We make soup. So Bill has created the box here, the beautiful structure, the um, vessel. And what Hub Culture does is fill the vessel. And we provide the experience in it, and we provide the culture in it. And a lot of what I think about Hub Culture in terms of evolution involves this kind of antiquated notion of 20th century or even 19th century ideals. You know, we've lived for only really 300 years in the age of the nation state. But what we're seeing with technology is increasing atomization and personalization. So when I look out at 2050, if hub culture still exists, <laughs> hopefully it will, I, I really, I think my dream for it is that it becomes the world's first virtual country. And specifically, the ambition of that idea would be to provide a safe space for the conscious evolution of the people who are part of that community. And you know, all the way from our investors to the people who work with us, this kind of conscious approach to what we do is at the heart of what we do. And I think it's what makes hub culture very different. And I find that the more we focus on that, the more we draw that kind of energy to us. And I think, Bill, that's what's drawn us together. There's something about the conscious energy of our people and the kinds of experiences that we aim to create that magnifies because it, it you know, I said to you two years ago, Bill, I need more space. And Bill responded with not just more space, but like a complete technological advancement for architecture. I find that a, an amazing thing. And I hope that hub culture can evolve into that kind of a safe place for people. What does that conscious evolution mean to you in terms of when you look at the future? In terms of this, I think the idea that um, we're connected to things, even with our consciousness, there's a whole world of connectivity to good things, bad things, propitious things. And when you look at the history of the internet, it's quite amazing to see the first maps of the internet that were done at Carnegie Mellon, mm -hmm. because they mapped who was talking to whom. And if you looked at the world, it looked like Seattle was the most mm -hmm. powerful place in the world because Amazon had started there and there were more connections to mm -hmm. Amazon to people than anywhere else in the world. So there it was, Seattle mm -hmm. was the center of the world. Right. Because every author had their name immediately connected to Amazon. Right. So if wow. you wrote something, you're connected to Seattle. It was mm -hmm. amazing. And then very slowly you saw the map shift down to Mountain View mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the hierarchical network mm -hmm. focused on Mountain View. And I think what Stan's talking about with hub culture is this net of people that, of goodwill speaking to each other mm. who are, are working in a creative process that becomes this nation, I guess you're calling it, but it's this network of things that's all over and people, it's really all over the planet, yet they're connected to each other through the hubs, which is this strange uh, non-hierarchical mm. network allowing you to freely move to the places where you can celebrate your locality, which is also quite amazing. So on one hand, you become a global citizen. On the other hand, you're a local 
hero mm -hmm. because you're connecting where you are to other places in ways that are manifesting beautifully. And that allows us to do the work of the hand locally and, and express local culture, but it also allows us to connect to all the things that are going on because we have access to art artificial intelligence too, but we give it our own values. Mm -hmm. So this freedom is a really key part of this, otherwise it becomes a constraint, and not a freedom. So I want to pick up a couple of things that you said there. Freedom, artificial intelligence, <coughs> a world in the future. I mean, what, when you describe the first virtual nation state, it sounds a little bit like a Neil Stevenson novel in which we have almost a sort of return to city states, each with their own currency, which you can trade. That's sort of one part of it, which isn't so far away from what you're describing. And then the other side of it is when we are connected, not just of an internet of things, but when our brains are connected. So when, when there's something in our brain that connects us to the internet, which then could also connect us to each other. How do you see that? Well, first of all, I love Neil Stevenson, and I've read most of his books, and I've been constantly amazed by what I think are actually his incredibly astute insights into how things could evolve. Um, I think that we're actually on the verge of a very dangerous time, because the decisions that are, we're making now about how we um, embed structures into what is effectively the, the machine is incredibly important, and I think as a society, we highly underestimate that. So beyond like the eventual rise of AI, this, there are a lot of things that are happening today that do not, I don't think, bode very well for human freedom. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know, some of the principles that we've stood for, the Windover principles around individual data ownership, um, the idea of transparency but personal responsibility, these kind of values that we've embedded in hub culture, and we've uh, achieve those from other influences. Um, I, I worry a little bit that we don't anticipate enough how complete these changes are and how connected we are all becoming. I mean, I, look at the migrant revolution that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. I think that this is partially a result of technology more than anything. When we were, we were in Frankfurt interviewing these refugees and they told us that they basically got on their smartphone before they left mm -hmm. Syria and they downloaded a map and they saved it on their smartphone. And then they walked to Germany. I mean, there is something about the long reach of technology into the mm -hmm. world that is connecting us and causing like radical change in upheaval very fast. And, you know, I don't know how we are going to deal with that as a society. We have to, I, I think we just have to understand that we have to work towards good and not be afraid of mm -hmm. whatever else is out there. I talked to somebody today about um, a Hippocratic Oath for people for artificial intelligence um, engineers. Where else should we be taking a Hippocratic Oath? That's a really great question. Um, the, the issue of the Hippocratic Oath would, for me, start with the question, do you begin with a double negative of do no harm? Mm -hmm. Or do you begin with a positive statement mm -hmm. of do more good? Mm -hmm. you know? So that's really interesting. That's where I think it comes to design. So doing no harm means, means don't make things worse in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Whereas providing more good, I think, is a it's curious a one at this point in history. Mm -hmm. And if so, for example, the standpoint, if we actually instructed the AI mm -hmm. that its job is not to do no harm, mm -hmm. because then it could be perpetuating the existing system, which is quite harmful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then it is yeah. doing harm, even though it was meant to be doing harm, but it'll translate that into doing nothing. Well, we've seen that. That's what happens in the environmental movement. <laughs> you know, be less bad, reduce the carbon emissions, but we're still emitting carbon. Right. So wait, 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 wait. You know. Yeah. So if we said, be beneficial, and then we start to set about describing what that is, that's interesting. That gives and me goosebumps. And then the tool of AI <laughs> is now helping us be more good, not be less bad, or be nothing. That's really interesting. Now, AI becomes a tool because what is our fear? Our fear is that we become tools of AI mm. instead of AI as our tool. And we see the same in nature because we've seen people using nature as a tool. And that's interesting. And so 
when you see the machine in the garden and we see, you know, in my world, Le Corbusier is saying, a house is a machine for living in. Mm -hmm. Huh, that's modernist. Mm -hmm. Well then, does that mean a church is a machine for praying in? Mm -hmm. Is that what that means? Ooh. And then we start to use living machines where we're using nature as a tool. So we'll have artificial greenhouses purifying our water with different mm -hmm. plants from rainforest and whatever. Now we've used nature as a tool for humans. That's very interesting. What I'm interested in is actually the next step, which would be when can humans become tools of nature? Because nature needs us now. Mm -hmm. And all the big ads by the big environmental groups mm -hmm. all say nature, we don't, you know, mm -hmm. nature doesn't need us. Humans need nature. Yeah. Nature needs us desperately right now. <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, yeah. we have to restore this place. The monarch butterflies mm -hmm. are collapsing. Every railroad bed should be mm. moon, you know, should be uh, uh, milkweed. You know, so what do we need to do right now? We need to change the name of milkweed to monarch flower and make it the national flower because who plants weeds? You know, we need to change the <laughs> words, you know, to indicate our intentions, you know, bring back the butterflies, you're going to say. So we need AI on, in service of butterfly restoration. Okay, so in 2050, we're going to have neat renamed More butterflies. monarch. Yeah, and we'll okay. have wheels on our luggage. You know, Last you know. word for you. What, are we, what else are we going to have done by 2050? Um, well, I think the pace of change is absolutely accelerating. Everybody knows that. So we can't really predict exactly what will happen. I think the last thing I'd think about is that it seems like if you look through the 20th century, there have been massive technological innovations that have resulted in, um, quite frankly, cataclysmic conflict. And the first one was radio, and then you had uh, World War I. And then you had television, and very shortly, World War II. Um, with the internet, which is kind of the third big thing, um, and these, these things happen quite a bit of time after, almost like a generation after, long enough for it to be taken uh, for granted. And we're at that point now with um, the internet. And so we've, we've got two 20th century lessons, and I think it's really important that we think about how we maintain peace and prosperity for this third iteration and make sure that we don't have negative consequences. You know, the, the, the issue is that each one of these is like um, a, a scale higher. They're almost exponential um, impacts that come from these technological advancements. You know, I guess the last thing I can think of is, you know, they talk about in space this idea of Fermi's paradox. And Fermi's paradox is this idea that if there are statistically a billion planets in the, in the, in the universe that are like Earth, why haven't we seen any evidence of human life? And one of the leading theories of that, or not even just human life, but any kind of life whatsoever, one of the, the leading kind of theories about that is that at some point, the, the matrix of exponential impact by whatever life form um, is so great that they just extinguish themselves. Um, so we should try not to be one of those. Okay, well on that cheery note, we're gonna draw it to a close. Thank you very much, Stan and Bill, and I'm Amy Lush. <laughs>